All right, you guys ready? All right, webcam. On. There, there I am. Oh. All right. Tonight, we are going to be going through uh, identity access management. So, but Tuesday finished on time, two times in a row. Yes, because I'm just going to go through this really fast and not answer any questions. Okay. I'll make sure we finish on time. Now, uh, check in. Everybody doing okay with where we're at? Are the brakes helping? Yeah. Kind of give you a chance to get caught up and stay up on pace. Okay, good. Okay. How many people have read all f uh, through chapter five so far? A couple? <laughs> Not quite. All right. Only 104? Nice. That's easy. That's easy. Especially if I don't answer questions. All right, quiz, what is the most secure type of firewall? A packet filter, a stateful firewall, a circuit level proxy, or an application layer? Man, I wasn't here on Tuesday, so I don't remember any of this, so I'm going to count on you guys. No, um, well, first, what do you guys think? Z. Z, application layer. All right, so packet filter is going to be, well, filtering your packet. Stateful is, oh, man, I don't remember. Where is the session? Yeah, thank you. A session aware. Circuit's looking at the circuit. Application is going to actually look at your application uh, uh, rather than a session at an application level. So, yep, application layer. All right, what WAN protocol has no error recovery, relying on higher level protocols to provide reliability? ATM, frame relay, SMDS, or X25? I'm going to go, well, I know this one, so it's well, guesses. I'm, I'm not going to go through it like Evan does. It's our difference. I know it's frame relay. Frame relay is going to be just uh, just that connection doesn't provide go away doesn't provide the um, any reliability. So it's relying on on the overlaying protocols. Frame relay. What is the most secure type of EEP? EEP TLS, EEP TTLS, LEAP, or PEEP? I was going to say, I think it's, I'm not going to look at the answers. I think, I think it's EEP TLS. Because I don't know why, though. It is TLS, because it's using TLS. PEEP is older. I don't remember what these stand for. Man. TLS uses PKI and has mutual authentication. Yeah, there you go. TLS doesn't authenticate the client. We know who was paying attention last class. Thank you. Yeah, or or does this on a on a day to day basis? What endpoint security technique is most likely to prevent previously unknown attack from being successful? So a signature based host a HIDS host intrusion application whitelisting and perimeter key here is a previously unknown attack from being successful. You're looking at uh, a signature base that's going to be known attacks, right? We're looking at signatures of known attacks, so it's not going to be that one. A host intrusion is going to be looking at the uh, at the host application whitelisting or perimeter firewall. If I'm looking at those four, I'm going to eliminate signature based and a uh, HIDS right away and look at either application whitelisting or perimeter firewall. Firewall is not going to prevent any unnecessarily an unknown one. So we're going to look at application whitelisting. Why? Because that's the one thing that it's only going to allow to run what you've approved, right? You're only allowed to run the whitelisted applications. There we go. All right. Which wireless security protocol is also known as the RSN, RSN Robust Security Network and implements the full 802.11i standard? So AES WEP. The VPA or WPA2, yeah. Why, so we're looking at wireless protocol, so that, that takes gets rid of AES right away. We know WEP is not secure. So WPA or WPA2, WPA2. Restricting Bluetooth discovery relies on the secrecy of what? MAC address, symmetric key, private key, or public key? So when you do the Bluetooth, what is it looking at? Well. We're always going to do a, if it's a key, right? Private key would always be private, but 
that's not going to help us with uh, uh, discovery, right? It's, that's once we've already made that connection, that's how it's trusted. So I know right away I can get rid of C or D. So, and well, symmetric key, that's not going to help, right? Because that's, again, going to be about actually encrypting it, not discovery. So MAC address. There we go. So that's my thinking as I go through this stuff and the ones I don't remember because we're the first ones. All right. Identity and access management. This is a big one. This is, uh, I don't know, if you're doing IT at all, I think this is pretty straightforward. This is the one that I, I always, it just kind of naturally to me because um, I managed AD, which is all about identity and access management. So this is where we left off. Authentication methods, access control technologies, access control models. <coughs> um, again, not challenging, but you don't want to let your guard down. Again, it, when, when you're looking at the, uh, the test, you're going to have those four questions, and it's going to be which is the most correct. So there's oftentimes it's going to be multiple answers that are correct, which one of those is the most correct. All right, uh, page 293 in the book. All right, so here's our uh, keys, crossover error rate. So that's where you have a false reject and a false accept rate are equal. So that's when people get rejected when they shouldn't be and get accepted when they shouldn't be. So when you have an, uh, that being equal, it's really what you're uh, looking for there. So you're not, you don't want to be having too many false rejections, right? Because then your, your users can't do their job. And if they're always constantly getting rejected, that's going to impact the business, it's going to impact productivity, it's going to impact their ability to work. Versus a false accept rate, if you have too many false acceptance, now you've got people getting to access to things they shouldn't have access to. So the uh, discretionary access control, so full control of objects they have, that have, they have created or been given access to, so sharing objects with other subjects. Um, that would be when, like if you've got a Windows file share and somebody creates it and they're the owner of that and they can actually go in and create and share that out uh, and give access to permissions to others in, in order to get to it. False accept rate is, well, unauthorized subject is accepted by a biometric system as valid. This is a type two. You do need to know that, uh, that it's a type two error and then false reject is a type one. You will want to know the difference between those two because they do reference type one, type two uh, in the exam, or at least they did. So again, false accept is when uh, if David's not supposed to have access to it and gets access to what uh, through the reading uh, to get in, right, through biometrics, that's a false accept. And then a false reject would be, you know, if Joe is allowed access, but it's rejecting him because the, the reading is not uh, not accurate. Uh, mandatory access controls, so system enforced access control on subjects clearance and object labels. So I think the key here, the way I remembered it, mandatory access, subjects clearance. This is typically going to be more government military. Okay, I've never seen it in my you know business day to day uh, where we've had mandatory access controls. So discretionary is where they can give full access. Mandatory is subjects clearance. And then role-based access controls, that's where you're grouped into roles and, and have it. So that's where Active Directory or others like that would come into play, uh, LDAP, which is what Active Directory is based on. Um, <clears throat> that's where you, you, know, you have a group and give the group permission. You have those roles, right? Have, that's where you give those permissions rather than to the individual. Pretty straightforward. Everyone got all those? Yes. I had the too far, the far question on a sample exam mm -hmm. today, and I just remember the phrase too far, and it just fell right into place. Too and far. So, oh, wow, that's clear. Yeah. So for the false accept rate, far, it would be too far, and that's a type 2 error, too far. That's a good way to remember it. That's, that's very easy. Or that's far. good. The false access, you're going to have some stranger coming in, getting authenticated. Yep. You're in deep number two. <laughs> you have a, if you have somebody coming in that's not supposed to be, you're in deep number two. I, I like that one as well. Those are both good. <laughs> All right. So authentication methods. Subject first identifies themselves 
this is the identification cannot be trusted, right? So I just come in and say, I'm Brad. Great. Anybody can come in and say, this is who I am. There's no um, trust behind that, right? So then we authenticate by providing assurance that the claimed identity is valid. So uh, how do we authenticate? Um, if we look at the bottom bullet there, three basic authentication types. So something you know, passwords, it's the most common for that. Uh, something you have, so a key card, key system, of uh, the R, like the RSA or Duo uh, tokens, or type three is something you are, so biometrics. So you'll, you will want to know type one, type two, type three for that. Uh, fourth type would be someplace you are. So that would be where you could do geolocation as well. Right. So if they're coming, it can only be logged into from within the internal network, can't be logged into externally, uh, could be another way for that. So very quickly moving forward, authentication is something you know. Uh, it's a challenge response, right? It's going to be it, um, knowledge-based questions, password, PIN, things like that. Uh, when you're granted access on something you know. This is the most common, I think. It's easy to implement, and but unfortunately, it's pretty weak, right? Because how many people pick strong passwords or knowledge-based questions where they could be something they know and then that information is available on social media, publicly available. But this is probably the, the easiest, so it's the most uh, common thing out there. So when we look at passwords, uh, you want to really go with passphrases. Those are going to be long static passwords. So uh, a, for a sentence, right? The second one is a, the second bullet is a really good example. I'll pass the CISSP in two months. <clears throat> when you have uh, a passphrase, especially in Windows and Active Directory, spaces count as a valid uh, symbol. Most people don't seem, don't don't realize that. So you can use proper grammar in a in a uh, passphrase. Most companies. And their policies are still telling users don't use any dictionary word. I know. Well, in unfortunately, well, that just changed pretty fairly recently with NIST, which may is going to make it easier. But I know I've been preaching past phrases for gosh, probably what, two, five years at this point, right? It's just easier. The long length is your friend here, right? It's not complexity. If if you have to write it down to remember it, that's not going to help anyone. So they, have to the of on that they did, or they made that recommendation. But again, it's the way I look. Well, the way I look at it is, I would say with a long, with a passphrase, unless you've got multi-factor enabled, I would still change it maybe every six months, right? The risk being, what's the big? How do most breaches occur? Phishing attacks, right? They're going to bypass it. So how long are you willing to sit there and have a passphrase that's long but has been phished and given up? Yep. Distributed, yes. Yeah. I mean, I had to change my password one, one, basically twice a year. It's really not that bad. And then if you went to multi-factor, you could go out longer. I, again, but I think, you know, it's it's that that's their advice. I would say I'd still have it changed, but. If you do multi-factor on there, it does add additional assurances. Yeah, every 45 days or whatever, is, or every 60 days even is is pretty pretty much overkill if you have a long a good password policy and, and controls in place for it. Um, so the passphrases again, less randomness per character compared to shorter complex passwords, but they make it up for for it with length. When you look at it, remember, when you're looking at passphrases, you've got 26 uppercase, 26 lowercase, 10 numbers, and a 23, I think, special characters. So you all add that all together, it's 90, 90, 95, somewhere in that range, characters for each letter. So as you go out, the longer it is, it becomes exponentially more difficult to figure out what that passphrase, because there's so many more combinations that it could become. So that's where you want to go with length. Um, and again, it's easier to remember than that password of B dollar percent JIU star exclamation, right? 
I'm not going to remember that one. I'm going to mistype it, but I'll remember that passphrase above. So go with passphrases. Those are secure. Uh, One-time passwords, again, single authentication. Um, is Yeah, very difficult to manage, very secure, right? Because you're only using them one time. You, you have it, you create it, you give it to somebody. Uh, a good time for the good one for this would be... Um, uh, Oh, what's the code? Uh, the the code book where you would. Ow, oh, where's Evan? He knows that. I can't think of it. It's for the encryption when you have the, the code books with one time passwords. What's that? Like one time pad. Yeah, the one time pad. Thank you. I was close. Code pad, one time pad. Right. So you just have, it's one time, it's used, that's it. It can't be used again. Very difficult to manage, though. So dynamic passwords. Change at regular intervals. So um, secret, uh, RSA is codes. That Duo is another one. There's a bunch of tokens out there. Um, these are going to be the one uh, that change every 60 seconds, right? So you get it. You got the little timer. The little clock is going down. Uh, problem is now you've got tokens. Now now they've come out with apps on your phone, so you can do use that. So it kind of mitigates some of the uh, the cost for the tokens. Right, it helps. It's additional uh, security because it, it's only good for a set period of time. Then it's going to change. It's going to be another one. So even if someone intercepts the password, they're going to have to intercept it or get get that attack in in a very short period of time. Multi-factor or strong authentication is more than one authentication factor. So again, password and a, a token, password and biometrics. So it's a, it's a combination of two or more. Of the authentication methods. And two or more different factors. To yes. Really yes. Yeah. Two or more different factors. That's a good point. So if you have, we've seen that where they have to log in with a password and then log in again with another password. It's not multi-factor. That's two single-factor logins. That's not multi-factor. So it would be again two different kinds, um, and you can have uh, you know more than two. Right. You could have a passphrase, a token, and a biometrics for. So All right. those systems that have you like pick a security picture that are password and security picture, I mean, it's better than just it's, a password. It's better than it's those two things you know. Yeah. So the the question was the security where it has a, you pick a picture so that you know it's your account that you're logging into. It's still two things you know. Yeah. It's better than uh, better than just the one, right? I think that's more going towards uh, authenticating that or validating that you're on the right you're in the right account but it's it was not it's not adding a significant amount of security to it still better than than nothing or just a single password all right hashing and cracking so when you have clear text password you don't typically or when you have the password right clear text would be in notepad and excel excel encrypted does not count that's not actually encrypted that's easy to break so hopefully you're not saving your passwords in a password protected uh, excel um what you have is a hash output so it runs it through one of the hashing algorithms right uh and whatever system you're using it you, you can typically pick that so what you get is you put in your password it runs it through the algorithm, and what you get is that that uh, looks like the block of garbled gook, right? It's just randomness. That's what's stored is that hash. Uh, and then it so it's one-way encryption using the algorithm no key. When you log in, your password is hashed again against that same algorithm and compared to the hash. And if they match, now you've got you're good. Um, can't be reversed, so we can't take the hash and run it backwards and get a password out of it. So when you look at, when you're running the attacker, what they try to do is they'll look at the hash. Remember, and we talked about this in the encryption piece. When we're looking at the attacks, they, they run it through and look for the same, right? That's the collision. So they'll run passwords or run, run um, uh, characters through hashing and look for those comparisons or where do, where do they come out the same? Now they can know, okay, here's where we're at. I know these are the, uh, the correct letters. All right, so hashes for Unix and Linux. That's where the location is. Um, readable by root. I don't think that's on the test. 
Um, Windows is on the domain controller in the SAM file. Uh, password hashes may be sniffed on networks or read from memory. So the, ha the, the hashes need to be protected, right? Because in theory, you could get an attack against those hashes. That's what people brute force against password hashes. Uh, SAM files in Windows operating system, you can get those and dump the hashes from memory, um, which, yeah, you can, you can absolutely run that because it's known what the algorithm is that Windows uses. So how do you think they get all the, here's the most common passwords, right? It's, they're running these common dictionary words against those hashes and, and they can figure that out. Um, yeah, this is easy stuff, right? Everybody's wide awake. Uh, can enable hash calculator. That's Evan's favorite tool. The only difference between the two entries is the P and password is capitalized. There we go. So if you look, where is it? You can see, oh, wait, hold on. Let me get my, my pointer here. So you've got your LM hash and your NT hash. LM hash is not as secure, so that's why in AD you want 16 character or longer um, passwords if possible. NTLM is, uh, or the LM hash isn't, isn't good. So you can see the difference here. If we've got a password, it's empty. You can see it's all the exact same, right? So we would be able to compare these and go, oh, these all have the same password. NT hash is, is a little bit more secure and that it's just gonna change it. Trying to see what else. There's actually another slide. It's on figure six point two. Oh. oh, okay. There you go. Page two ninety eight of the book, figure six point two. I I'm, Evan's in the other room, so I won't blame him. Also, I could have looked at this a little bit more before I started, but that's okay. Uh, dictionary attacks. So using a word list, uh, you can get word lists. They're out there on the internet. It could be text files. You'd be surprised how many words you can fit into a text file. And it just reads off of it and just cranks through looking for those collisions. Um, least effective, very fast though, right? Because it could be hundreds of thousands of words or whatever it is just screaming through them, looking for those collisions, but uh, it's not effective. Uh, that's where you kind of get that brute force uh, going. So you will tune, they will tune the dictionary to the target. So uh, depending on location, right? Is this a, if you're in Spain or France or Germany, they'll add a language appropriate dictionary for you. Uh, again, I've seen it with uh, uh, industry specific as well. So uh, city specific, you could even get down to, I would, I would think so. Um, Packet Storm has multiple dictionaries. Actually, kind of interesting to go through and and look at if you're if you want to look at what those dictionary or uh, lists look like. Run out there and you can just go out and and get them for free and just look through all the different uh, dictionary lists and and be terrified. Uh, so, user organizations require users to create the password as a special character. Number, capital letter, eight characters or greater. So the problem with that is eight characters now no longer considered secure, right? We're looking at at least 10 at least or 12 characters because remember, we're going to get length out there because the processing power has gotten better. Um, yeah. So in the book, and I don't know the page on that, uh, Kane Enable cracked Deckard, D. Eckerd's password with a dictionary attack. The password was replicant shown as capital all capital replicant, which LM hash ignores case. So you're actually now shortening the number of characters possible, right? Because it's LM hash isn't as secure. So it sees that uppercase, lowercase is the same. Scores everything is uppercase. And then we just taken away 26 characters potential for each character of length. Uh, again, to secure this, access to the SAM file and shadow file should be restricted. Really should, you know, 
really never really need to access to that unless you're doing a password dump to test security of your passwords on your network, which is fun to do. And again, and if you really want to be terrified, you know, get approval before you do any of that. And I would recommend doing it from a backup in a test environment and not dumping it from production because uh, that can cause some problems and you don't, you don't want to have to explain why you took down AD to, right. to test your password hashes or but hashing skills. Said, right. From I said to do it from test and get approval before you do it. So uh, how are we <laughs> how are we doing attacks on this? Brute, brute attacks, great. Uh, brute force and hybrid take time that are effective. They calculate the hash output for every possible password and then compare it to your hashes, right? So they're going to calculate just brute force these passwords, run all these dictionary words through. Uh, through their algorithm and look for collisions and see if they can find any matches. Uh, it's calculating that hash for every possible password. So you see the CPU speed, this comes very, uh, this is why we need to go longer, right? Back back in the day, it, the CPU power was, was such that it took a long time. Eight characters was, was okay, right? It would take years and years and years to crack that. Now an eight character password, I mean, I, I did. I actually did a uh, when where I was working at the at the bank and stuff. They we wanted to go from eight to ten, and I was like, we got to do this. And I, so I put together this whole thing. And I actually wanted to go to twelve, and this would have been in like thirteen and two thousand thirteen. But I got voted down. But I put together a whole thing. And in, in two thousand thirteen, it would have taken you know like maybe an hour to break an eight character com complex password that was truly randomly generated just with available tools and a desktop machine. Now you're probably looking at, you know, minutes, seconds to crack through some of that stuff. So you want to go longer, make it more complex. So there's more possibilities than they have to go through uh, rainbow table. So rainbow table is kind of like the dictionary, but I've already pre-hashed, right? So now you're just taking these tables of pre-hashed passwords, and just comparing them and looking for matches. They don't even have to do the brute force and run it through the dictionary. They already know, here's what these hashes look like for these passwords. As soon as you hit it, you're good. So it's gonna cut down on the time for uh, for that. Now, again, it doesn't, doesn't include all possible ha password and hash com combinations, but if you can take a, a rainbow table that has 100,000, 200,000 hashes already, and run those through. You've already all you need is one hit to get into a into a network, right? So if you can bring that down. It's really going to help. Um, the hybrid attack takes that brute force, changes the com uh, characters uh, from a dictionary before hashing. So that's where you would have uh, that leet speak, right? Where it's going to be substituting out a zero for an O, a three for an E, stuff like that. So it's, it's going to be trying to com uh, run through that for those those common dictionary words. Any questions? Just to give you an example, we're doing a project now where we've got a, a customer that had about 17,000 um, hash passwords that, that we got. Mm. And we're using um, some cloud computing where you can just rent the computer by the hour. Yep. Up in paper space, so a, a pretty beefy GPU box. It's like, you know, a couple of bucks an hour. Yes. But after 48 hours, we had gotten through about 6,500 of the 17,000. Gotten through the meeting. Like, crack. cracked them? Yeah. But, you know, we, we pulled in um, uh, a few different rainbow tables, a bunch yeah. of dictionaries. And, it makes um, it, it, it's crazy what's out there to make it that much more. What was the, what was the password requirement? Uh, they were doing... Uh, between 8 and 13 characters. They had some legacy systems, so they couldn't go longer than 13 characters. Um, uh, yeah, most, probably most of those you got were, were either like well, you password, one way, or five. You would be surprised, but it's like company name, yeah. winter 2017. I mean, it's all that standard <laughs> stuff that you see. I was doing a. Yeah, I was doing a, a uh, general security awareness training session for uh, a company for a client and one of them it says like it goes through how to make a secure password 
So don't use things like, and it, it's a, it shows what it was. It was spring 2018 or 2017. It was last year. And uh, it shows how long it takes to crack it. And it's like, well, this is why we don't use these things because it's known. And afterwards, there's a bunch on there, but afterwards somebody came up and goes, so if I saw my password on the screen, that's not good, right? It's like, <laughs> no, it's known. And why, why do people do that though? You have to change your password every 90 days. So what are they going to do? Season in the year. You know, we we did that. You know, another one where you, when we look at it, I'm like, I don't think it's on there, but when we we try to go through and say, you know, you should have to change a certain number of characters in your password. Now, I don't AD doesn't support that natively. There are tools that'll do it wherever you can implement it. You should. Same thing. We got in and I don't. It was like you know, Teddy Bear three was the password, and we told them. They said, yep, it's been changed, so what do we do? I went back in and Teddy Bear 4, guess what? Got right back in, right? So incrementing those passwords isn't good. So it comes back to training awareness, but also where you can change it so that uh, you have to change it more than, or you, you can't have the same, a certain number of, pa of uh, characters be the same, wherever you can. <laughs> All right, so what are some tools for this? Brutus, online password cracking tool, um, Windows systems back in October of 2000. I actually have never used uh, Brutus. I don't know if it's any good or not. Uh, Rainbow crack, hash cracking. So it's going to use uh, memory trade off for pa faster pa password cracking. Um, again, it, it's looking at it's going to uh, run through the, the passwords and, pa and hash them. It's going to give you that rainbow table. It takes a long time, but once it's done, you've got your rainbow table, and now you're set for all your different different attacks moving forward. WFuzz, uh, web application, again, brute forcing. Um, I haven't used that one either. I don't do many wrong things, apparently. Uh, identify different kinds of injection, SQL, cross-site scripting, LDAPs, and web apps. And another tool, Cane Enable I have used. Uh, Well-known password cracking tool. I think it came out, I was gonna say when it came out, late 90s, early 2000s. It hasn't, it hasn't been updated in like 15 years or something, and it still works great. We were talking about that after the other class when, when Evan remembered what it was. Yeah, it still works. So does a lot of everything, kind of that jack of all trades. Uh, John the Ripper I've used, that's a fun one. Um, Windows version is available, but it's gonna be running for weak passwords. Uh, did not use the pro version. Seems like, well, I never had a need for, for that. I use some of these tools for, for exactly doing that to check passwords on my AD, right? You got to download it and check it somehow. Fun to, fun to play with. None of these, I don't remember any of these being on the test. I remember. I give you know them, you know, that, that'll be good, but I don't, I don't think there's any of these specifically on the test. Um, again, THC Hydra, another one. Shows why it's faster. Um, again, I haven't I haven't used this one either. So, sure, it's faster. I know they, they all work very similar. Um, Medusa, another one supporting a bunch of different uh, uh, attacks. There, a whole lot of them. You can you can change your <laughs> Change, cracking the password, you can change your host, username, and password. Flexible input while performing an attack. That's, it's scary. Uh, rainbow table uh, for off crack there, cracking tool for Windows, um, Linux and Mac as well, but it's really looking at in LM and NTLM hashes. So uh, you can grab different rainbow tables and run it through and, and have that to, to run your password hashes if you were to get some against it. Again. And then loft crack is an you know, alternative for it. 
So again, same thing, looking for hashes, uh, looking for a comparison, dictionary brute force as well. Uh, Symantec was, grabbed it, just can you, in 2006, and coming back in 2009. Same, they're all really similar, just how quickly they, they run through this stuff. And again, I don't remember any of these being uh, on the actual exam. Aircrack is for Wi-Fi, so WEP or WPA. Hopefully nobody's using WEP passwords. WPA, I don't think it can do, well, I don't remember if it does WPA too. But anyway, SMS attack with other attacks for cracking the password, um, Linux and window. It can just install it on your laptop and walk around and crack Wi-Fi passwords, really is what that comes down to. A little scary what's freely available out there. There's some other stuff that you can do for uh, for this as well with looking at like um, uh, Rapid7 uh, tool, Metasploit. It's not a password cracking, but it's looking for exploits. Get in. It's freely available, and then you can use you know an open source password cracking once you get in. All free, all available. All right, so how can we avoid uh, some of this? We're going to salt it one, one password to hash multiple ways. So we're going to add random characters to the front of that password. So when you have your if it's password, it's going to salt it. So when you when you put it through with unsalted, your hash is a specific set of characters. To salt it, we're now going to change it up. So when, every time you put that password, the word password through, it's going to change. It's going to know uh, uh, that, that random value is going to change so that your hash is not the same no matter what you do when you're when you put your passwords through so uh it'll again encrypts differently each time and when it's used by different users so you would have to encrypt the same password multiple times for each salter user in order to attack mount a successful attack it makes those rainbow tables less effective if not entirely infected or ineffective so again Again, when you have it, it's going to be a, a random value. So when I put in my word, my password is password. You put your pa your password is password. I, if all of us had the same password and put it through a salted hash, none of us would have. Uh, at the end of the day, um, uh, none of us would have the same hash if we if they were salted. Does that make sense? Okay. Again, and you can see why that would make rainbow tables less effective, right? If the salt is tied to a specific user, you'd have to know exactly that. And then it's it's going to change. So even if they got my password and knew what the hash was, it's going to be that that ended up hash is going to be ineffective for anyone else. If they implement it correctly. So password management. Uh, and oh, going back to salt, so you will need to know what salting is, right? So it's just going to be random, random variables for each password, so no two passwords hash the same. Uh, password management, password history, uh, 24 passwords, so you can't reuse a password for 24 iterations. Key there is you don't want people just cycling through password one, password two, password, and getting right back. Uh, minimum max age is 90 days. Minimum of 20 of two days. Again, goes right right there. This is to make sure people don't cycle through it. Right? We would. I actually changed it to a little bit longer than that, um, just to ensure that it would be the same as that maximum password age. So it, it actually didn't make sense for people to change it. And if they forgot their password and needed to change it again, they would call. It's up to you. Um, but you do want to have a minimum password age. You don't want people to just cycle through passwords with no no time between it. Um, minimum length eight characters again, not that's not valid anymore. Must meet complexity, so that's going to be right now. It's three of the four, right? So you get numbers, uppercase, lowercase, number, and special characters. Complexity would be three of the four. Your password contains three of the four of those types of characters. Um, and then you want to make sure that password using reversible encryption is turned off. To me, that's kind of self-explanatory. We're reversible encryption. That means that you could get the password. 
So that's the minimum set for the Department of Defense um, by Microsoft right now. Again, NIST just came out last month or two. Was it earlier this year for sure? I don't remember. Was it March maybe, February? Um, with with new new recommendations to go with passphrases, longer passwords with a longer um, uh, time between the maximum password age should be longer. I don't know. I don't think that that would be on the test yet, though. Uh, again, uncommon. It's not uncommon for users to write down passwords and store them in wallets, address books. Uh, when you, and, uh, well, so when we do the physical pen testing or we do the physical walkthroughs, I always look at the upper right drawer. And you, more often than not, if you look in enough, you'll find passwords. Um, I did one. Uh, where it was going into a healthcare and I was able to get into the back area and walking past through one of the specialties, uh, they had a, a username and password on a post-it tape to the monitor in a public area. So, no way. So I sat down and entered it and yep, got right in. Come on. So it does happen. Um, and I mean, that's why we want to go with passphrases. It's easier for people to remember. So anything we can do to minimize People having to write down their passwords, uh, it's going to help security. And so coming back, complex passwords are harder to remember. Complexity is, the, is op often the enemy of security, right? If we can keep it simpler, it's going to make it easier to, to secure. So if we can go a passphrase that people can remember, it's easy to remember, that's going to be a, a better um, security than a 10-digit computer randomized password. Um, yeah, so I mean, users can write, who write those passwords down are undermining the entire, entire security posture of a system. It doesn't matter how good our technical controls are if we're, people are bypassing those controls. So we want to make it so that they don't need to write that down. Didn't Bruce Schneier say that uh, if you write down your password, it's like, that's a, for, that's like an acceptable minimum? Uh, you know, I don't know. I haven't seen that. Did he? Yeah, he's basically like for corporations who can't afford to be able to single sign on. Right. You just write it down, put it in your wallet, and like if you lose your wallet, you got to go update your password. So it's like you treat it like you like you would use your credit card. You got to call your credit card. Yeah. I I mean, what we do say whenever anybody, if you lose it or you suspect it's been compromised, you need to immediately alert. You know, IT or security. So, yeah, I, I still would push against writing it down, but. So, well, so that comes back to. Um, we have manufacturing areas, shipping areas, and they just walk up to the terminal or whatever. So, when they, yeah, well, you know, you don't have accountability for who did what, right? That's That would be the concern on that. So, and I, I have seen it where. Uh, yeah, so it's going to take one time for them. To, that's what we see, right? Is is they log in and they're like, oh, we don't need any. It's going to be too much of a hassle. And then something gets messed up, and everybody goes, it wasn't me. Now, now you have no way of proving it, and you're just out of luck, right? But yeah, uh, one of the ways, you know, it's, and again, it comes back to money. Though we see it at, at healthcare is is with the badges. You can walk up and have your badge that would unlock it. And now each person is individual and it'll just change the login. We see that in healthcare uh, a lot. Nurses going into different rooms, uh, stuff like that. So authentication is something you have. So requires you to have it, right? So, um, well, there you go. Key, car keys, credit cards, ATM, smart cards, paper documents. Something you physically have with you. And the, um, a token, right? Something you have, a token. It's it's really pretty straightforward on that. Um, we have several different kinds here. So you have the synchronous dynamic tokens. So that's RSA, Secure ID, Google Authenticator, again, Duo. There's just Microsoft Authenticator. You can just go through the list of these. But it's going to have that time counter synchronized with the backend authentication server. It's only going to be good for a set period of time. So there's that what that would look like, right? So you've got the little uh, clock up there in the corner, counting down, and then it'll change that six-digit code. 
Everybody's seen those before. I used those before. Asynchronous is not synchronized with the central server, so it makes sense, right? Syn synchronous, asynchronous. We've been talking about that. Um, challenge response. You get a challenge input from the to uh, or input for the token, and then it gives it back um, and gets an output. So, uh, oh, here, there's a Evan's got a really good sample here. So, you would get the to the, you would get the challenge. You have to put your pin in, then put the challenge in. Where I see this was with um, uh, when we were encrypting uh, workstations. So, if there was an offline or we had to de uh, bypassing uh, boot and uh, startup encryption, you'd have to enter your password to get to that. And then to get past it, you had to call in to get a challenge token to put in that would then give you another token. And so it's going to be a multiple step process, right? So you get a challenge value displayed. You have to enter your challenge value into a token device. It's going to give it a different value. You then put that back into the workstation and that then gets you in. That makes sense. It's pretty. I don't know. I think it's pretty easy. If I'm oops, if I'm going too fast or kind of skimming it over it, let me know. Okay. This one was easy because this was what I did every day for a long time. So, and then something you are so biometrics um, used to establish identity or authenticate proven identity claim. Uh, so when we look through biometrics, the way I look at it, I don't think it's a good authenticator. This is my personal opinion. Others may disagree. Same thing with the password. What happens if your biometrics and are because they're going to be hashed, right? You're going to get a hash edit. Well, if it's not properly implemented and that, that's uh, breached, you can't change your biometrics. So for me, I don't I don't want to have something to authenticate that I can't change. I think it's a great authenticator, I mean identifier, but uh, it is used for authentication, fingerprints, things like that. But again, I, that's just me. Yeah, they've, see the yep, or, it's pretty easy to get by it um, with, you know, they, they took the, yeah, the fingerprint off the picture and yeah, there's, like this and yep, the they're the actually able to do them, uh, do like a 3D printing of it and, and bypass. Yeah. Yeah. So again, that's a good point, right? That goes to where I was saying, what good is it if you somebody's already got that, those data points on your hand? So were you, uh, a few years back where some high school implemented uh, fingerprints just to keep attendance because they want people in class, but the kids got around with gummy bears. Yeah. 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 You put your thumb into the gummy bear and then yeah. you can just press that against. It doesn't matter who's actually pressing it against it. Silly putty, it's another good one. So it's a, it's pretty easy to get around, unfortunately. Um, so again, associate with a physical trait. It's more difficult for that individual to forget, misplace, or otherwise lose control of it. Hopefully, um, I, I actually implemented biometrics for a, a company I work for that had people going overseas as a military contractor, and we had to make sure that we got multiple digits on both hands because they were, the concern was where they were going, they could lose a digit or a hand. So that's a problem if you get locked out because you, your finger got chopped. So something to, you know, it, it could happen, right? Um, should be reliable and resistant to counterfeiting. Unfortunately, with fingerprints, like we were talking about, it's now becoming a little bit more easier. We've seen it happen. Uh, data storage required to present, represent biometric information is pretty small. And again, they should be doing a mathematical uh, print and hashing that, but you're now ca counting on a proper implementation of it. If it's done properly, it should be fine. Uh, so biometric fairness, this is something to keep in mind. Uh, when you're doing biometrics, it shouldn't be causing undue psychological stress. So when you're doing it, the like the retina scans are super effective at that. Not many people want to go stick their eye up to the scanner and get get their eye scanned. So you have to weigh that in when you're looking at putting these controls in place. Uh, bodily fluid. So if you're putting your chin on, you know the the 
chin rest to make sure your eyes lined up properly. And if you know everybody else, are they wiping it between it? Now people are going to go, ugh, skeeving out a little bit. So you want to avoid that. Um, you know, the eye against an eye cup, think about, you know, pink eye uh, and fingerprint scanning where they're touching it. Um, passive control of the iris scans where they're, you're not doing a body fluid. There was one example that, that I remember that comes up. Let's see, I don't think it's in here, but one of the one of the things that they that you have to think about is uh, uh, personal information. So they were talking about the the instructor I had for when I did the class was working at a place, and this one of the employees had to get their password. They, they were doing uh, retina scans, but they had to get it changed, and it kept failing on them every. You know, every month, every two months, and that shouldn't happen. It turns out he's diabetic, which changes the blood vessel patterns. So now they have information that from biometrics that he didn't maybe want HR to know. So you got to keep that in mind as well when you're when you're looking at biometrics. Um, and so when you do biometrics, you have to enroll it. Should be very quick and easy. When you come in and say, here's who I am, put your fingerprint on, take it off, put it on, take it off, put it on. So then it says, okay, successful. It's gotten those data points and mapped it successfully. Throughput uh, is the authenticating to the biometric system. So how quickly does it respond back? So we don't want to have a long throughput. So if you put your finger on the scanner and it takes 20 seconds for it to respond back, that's a very bad throughput. People aren't going to want to do it if you're sitting there. The phone, how long does that take? It's on a phone. Yeah, it's in on the phone. I don't use it on the phone. Uh, not that I do anything illegal, but it's been ruled that it's the same as a physical key, your fingerprint to unlock a phone. You can be compelled to provide your fingerprint to turn over to unlock your phone. Whereas a password, you can could plead the fifth because it's something you know. I haven't done anything wrong. I hope to never use it, but... And sure. that's, yeah. Who was that? All right. I didn't hear. <laughs> Accuracy of the biometrics. So we want to we want to consider this when we're looking at biometrics again. We want this is what we we're talking about. Far, uh, well, FRR, FAR, and CER. So we need to know false reject rate, false accept rate, and crossover error rate. When we look at the false reject rate. When an authorized subject is rejected by the biometrics as unauthorized, so this is a type one, uh, this is going to be frustration. This is where your users are slowing down, and that's when you're going to get complaints and you're going to lose the buy in from staff to do this. You do want to avoid that. A false accept rate is when you have an unauthorized subject accepted as a legitimate or a valid um, person. So now you've got the risk of somebody who shouldn't have access into an area or into data having access to that. This is a type two, so man, too far, or if somebody to have a far area, you're in deep number two. Um, and then, well, let's see. Okay, so it's coming up on the next slide. Uh, so accuracy, false accept is worse than a false reject. You want, you don't want people coming in that don't ha shouldn't have access. Now you don't, you want to minimize your false reject rate because, well, that's when your employees are going to complain about it and productivity is going to go down and you're going to have to answer to management why nobody can do their job anymore. But uh, what you want to do, again, two is greater than one, so type two is, is worse than type one. That's an easy way to remember that. Uh, again, for fingerprint scan, 40 points, accuracy may be lowered by collecting fewer points. So the more point data points you collect, the more accurate it's going to be, but it's going to take longer and the more possibility for a, a false reject, or I'm sorry, false accept, but lower reject rate, but it's going to take longer, uh, longer to get in and, and increase it. So when you're looking at a crossover error rate, that's when your false reject and false accept rate are equal. That's really, that's the big thing to know about that. Um, it's, Get, that's your gauge of overall accuracy. Uh, yeah, so here's what that would look like. 
So we, we want to find what our threshold is. Again, we want our false accept rate to be typically lower than our false reject rate, but we need to find what that happy medium is, what's the correct point for us as an organization with using this system. Any questions on those those three things? You will need to know, again, false reject rate, false acceptance rate, crossover error rate, and it's type one, type two. Yep, it's also known as the equal error rate. I don't remember seeing that one, EER, on there, but uh, if you know crossover error rate, the ER is really the big part there, your error rate, crossover or equal error rate. And just know that it's going to be it's the center point of the X where those two intersect. So make sure you understand that. Fingerprint, so types of biometrics, so fingerprints, everybody very familiar with fingerprint scanning, especially now with the phones having that. Um, again, smart cards can require a user to present a fingerprint to unlock a computer screensaver, uh, could be used for storing, or the data used for it is really small, right? Again, we're looking at anywhere from 10 to 40 data points. Not a whole lot of data that needs to be collected. Uh, it's a mathematical representation of your fingerprint, so it's the way that the ridges and the swirls are, and they they map it out, and each one of them gets a mathematical value. Uh, retina scanning, so it's going to re scan the capillaries in the back of the eye. Um, it, it, a lot of people don't like this, right? Because you're putting your eye up to the cup. Oh, here, there we go. Right, you're going to put your your eyes up to the to the cup, and a, a, you're going to get your eyes scanned. There's a lot of hesitancy and, and pushback for that. Right. So uh, big exam warning there, retina scans rarely used because of the health risk and invasion of privacy issues. So really, you, you want to know about that, that they're not used very often because it's an invasion of privacy. People don't want that. And, and again, with the medical possibilities of finding out that there's an issue, uh, you don't want. So they're not used very often. Um, bodily fluid or privacy concerns. But it'll be used in almost every B science fiction movie you can find. Yes, yeah. Well, you know, the, the movies are always so accurate. So like, was it hackertype.com or whatever it is? I don't, or you could just randomly bash on the keyboard and it spits out like, looks like uh, you're hacking into the system. Fantastic. That's fun to use. Uh, it, I think it's like hackertyper.com or something like that. If you Google hacker typer, I think you can find it. It's, it's it doesn't matter what you type in, it's always going to put out spit out like Unix code. Dot net, yeah. Um, and so you push your head against it, push down to trigger it, and then it's going to scan your eyes. Not very often, it's not used. Uh, very intrusive and a chance for uh, uh, the exchange of body fluids. Iris scans, this is a passive biometric control, so it's going to take a picture of your iris and then compare that. Uh, works through contact glasses. Everybody's uh, irises are unique, so this is going to give you a very high accurate passive scan, right? So you don't have to push your eye up against anything. It's just going to, you're going to put, stand up against it to take the picture. When, right, you've enrolled, so it's going to have your picture. Now it's going to take a picture of uh, of you there and compare it against what it, what was in the uh, the database when you enrolled. So that would be what a iris scan looks like. I think those are a little bit more uh, expensive. So you don't. I haven't I haven't used I haven't been anywhere that's used an iris scanner. Hand geometry. That's another one. I've used out. I've had to do that. Um, and you go up and it's very similar to like a fingerprint scanner. You just put your hand on the map or on the keypad or pressure pad and it has like little posts that you have to line your fingers up in a certain order and then it scans to look at where your hand pressure points are. Um, pretty simple. Yep, that's exactly what I had to use. So you typically have a user code and then put your hand on there and it'll read the geometry of your hand. Um, I worked for a company that used them in the 
false root the reject rate was probably around fifty percent. Which is ridiculous. I did it. The one I used was at a data center to get in, and yeah, it was. You'd have to try it two or three times to get it to work. Sometimes, it's like, great, but it's there. Maybe they're better now. That was a long time ago that I used it. Uh, some additional types that are coming out there is keyboard dynamics, so they can watch how you type and get a cadence and and uh, the rhythm for your password or for, for how you're typing and it can verify that it's you putting in your password. Kind of cool. Um, yeah, right. Yeah, looking at how, how far back you have to go. Uh, how many times you have to do it before you get it enter it correctly and hit enter. Um, yeah, so as you learn to use, use your keyboard, everybody picks up a specific like pattern and habits and that's unique for everybody so you can actually you know, track the the, pa the pace and the pattern of of their typing and verify who's on there. There's a company in town called Intensity Analytics that does that. Oh, very cool. Uh, signature process measure by process the me me measure the process by which someone signs their name. So it's not just looking at the signature; it's actually how they're pressing it and actually as they write it to see if it's that person. I don't remember what store I was at, but I actually ran into this because I busted an arm, but I still could use the fingers. So I was huh. finding my name, but it didn't quite look right, and it immediately flagged the checker, check ID. Very cool. It happened the second or third time I visited, and then after that, it didn't ask again. So it must have learned that this was a valid signature yeah. and moved on. That was pretty wild when you realized it wasn't just you know, uh, being non-deniability and saying, no, yep. A lot. Well, yeah, that is interesting because a lot of well, and a lot of times with the the credit card signatures, it just is like a yes or no. Did you capture the? Did you get a signature? Right. It's not actually capturing the signature. It's only used if you challenge the purchase. Yeah. So. Oh yeah, I've had some with like holding a kid who's fussing, and it's just like one line straight across with a little couple like waves. Right. Because I was a cashier, someone just put a smiley face. So, don't look, sir, that's not your <laughs> he was just like, come on. I was like, okay. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> so these are, <laughs> that's funny, smiley face. So those are, uh, th these are more recent ones, I think, uh, that we're starting to see more of. I, I like the keyboard dynamics one. I haven't seen that. I'm sure there's probably a breach or a vulnerability to it, but it seems like that's a pretty good one. Same with the dynamic signature. Voice print, so how are you saying Phrases. How do you say words? So uh, something for that vulnerable to replay. So you can record in, uh, somebody and, and put it, play it back. Um, the other thing would be, right? As it says, how do you how do you beat, beat the replay? So you have them record as their enrollment certain phrases that ca capture the the different sounds and how they say different words, and then have them read back random words that contain those different. Um, Phonetical uh, variables. Facial scan. This is happening a lot now. Facial recognition. This is now everywhere, not just for um, authentication. Now they're using this for identification through airports and other public areas. Um, taking a picture of a, someone's face and comparing it to a picture to a stored database. Um, again, high cost. Law enforcement and security are using it for uh, to improve security for those publicly public areas. Again, uh, stadiums have it. I think a lot of them have that. Airports. The Super Bowl here in Minneapolis. Super Bowl. Used big time. Yep. Yeah, China's just doing it everywhere. I'm sure I think the UK has a lot of. Yeah, they have a lot of cameras out there. So. Uh, oh, there you go. Super Bowl, what, 30, 35, right? Yes. It was the first one to have facial recognition, looking for potential terrorists. Uh, no terrorists were identified. 19 petty criminals were identified. I'm not sure that the cost was worth those 19 petty criminals, but they're claiming it's a, a deterrent control that you'll get caught if you come here, so don't come here. Uh, Casinos have used it for a long time. 
you know, you can use facial scans and the iPhone to unlock and verify who you are, right? Uh, although that's been beaten with quality laser, color laser prints, where you can print out the person's face and hold it up and unlock it. But that was from the early stuff. A lot of like the newer ones. I don't know how they're doing it, with different focal lengths or depth or something. They're really getting, getting more better. geometry. Yeah, so it's looking more 3D in depth versus just uh, data points for how far the eyes apart, the length of the nose, things like that. Yeah, casinos are looking for for the what they call cheaters, right? All right. Access control technology. So that was identity. Now we're going to access controls. Man, we're going to finish on time. I say that now. Watch me slow down. Uh, centralized access control. So that's going to be a, um, into a single point, uh, logical point. So, um, you know, uh, a domain controller, right? So, so a single location for for that. So this is where you'd use single sign-on. Uh, a single sign-on is access or authenticate once, access many. So you have your AD credentials that are then tied to different applications. So you've identified, you've authenticated yourself to Active Directory, and then it's going to allow you to pass through and access those other applications. Uh, gives, again, it gives you that central uh, ability to for authorization, or sorry, authentication, authorization, and accountability. Who, who am I? Should I have access to this? And then. The, the accountability is, well, I can't say it wasn't me because I authenticated and I was authorized to get to it. Right? So I can't avoid, again, that, that uh, scenario where you've got a shared workstation and 15 people logging into it and everybody goes, not me. That's where we avoid, we want to avoid that situation. Decentralized. Uh, allows IT to occur closer to the mission and operation. So this would be, um, yeah, U.S. military. Uh, I would, I've seen it with um, like subsidiary companies, right? So each branch has its own AD that is managed locally, and then that would go back up to an enterprise at the, the top level. Um, U.S. military uses it uh, in battlefield. So every uh, combat group has their own um, access control so you're not because you're out in the field you may not have access back a uh, connection back right at the time so a big one here don't confuse about um dac and decentralized access control dac is the discretionary decentralized access will always be spelled out so if you see dac on there make sure that you know it's for discretionary access control Single sign-on, we talked about that. Multiple systems using a single authentication or central authentication server. Uh, again, you authenticate once and then multiple places are, that trust that authentication. Uh, makes administration a lot easier, right? Because you're managing one location rather than 20 different applications with users. It makes the user's life easier. Now they just have one password to remember. We don't have 20 passwords to remember, so now we can make that a little, uh, and make it simpler, right? Less less complex is always good. Uh, there's a bunch of tools, our Active Directory does, uh, has a lot of applications have tied into Active Directory. Uh, what's the other big one? Okta is a, is a very common, uh, popular one I see a lot of. Uh, to tie in one location, you log in there and it manages connections out. Man, it's a lot of words. It's all about single sign-on. So really what you're saying is, again, it's going to make it's make it easier for users. Right? They only have to remember one password. Now they're going in and they log in to their computer. They launch their application. They go to the website that's got it, whatever it is, and they're already in and working. They don't have to remember passwords for everything. And it comes back to the simplified administration. I was always about single sign-on if it was done correctly because it means that that's that many fewer calls I'm going to get about, I forgot my password. It's all about me. Uh, what are the disadvantages? So unless it was built um, 
with that in mind, it's very difficult to put, plug it in with uh, after the fact. So if you're building it out from scratch, well, it makes it a lot easier. So if you've got an Active Directory and you're put, bringing a new application in that supports it, that's a lot easier than, well, we're going to implement single sign-on and now I've got to make it work with everything that's already implemented. That's a lot more difficult. Um, and it's in a desktop, so if you do have single sign-on, somebody walks away and leaves their computer unlocked, well now anybody that walks up to it has access to everything they had access to versus if you walked up and I had to log into every application separately, I would just have access to that computer. I, I wouldn't know the passwords and how to get into the different applications. Uh, and then it's a single point of attack. So and if I'm an attacker, I, where am I going to target? each application individually or the one that has access to everything or one thing that has access to everything. Um, again, when you're looking at attackers, it's always the path of least resistance. What's going to give them the most bang for their buck? Okay, so that single sign-on server. What's going to cause the most uh, damage if I take it down? Single sign-on server. Uh, access provisioning life cycle. So, and this is a, it's pretty again, straightforward. So we're going to provision an account. We're going to give them a password. Any requests for access, we're going to grant that access. Do we need to modify that access? Uh, they leave. We're going to disable the account, retire it, or you know, delete it at that point. So, so life cycle going around. We want to check. Um, uh, yeah. Provisioning, yeah. Uh, one thing I would say on this, when you have a, a modify, so if you have a user changing groups, I always like to treat it and uh, as as if it was a termination in a new hire, right? So you're gonna say, all right, uh, David is moving from team A to team B on this date. It's a hard cut over. Okay, I'm gonna list all the groups he has in team A. We're gonna remove them from all that. Where are all the groups in team B? that he needs access to on added to that. There may be overlap, that's fine. But I, that way you don't get that permission creep, get a clean cut over. Or, um, you know, if there's transition time, at the end, you know, maybe you add them to both, all the groups, and then at the end of that transition time, you pull them out of everything and add it back to where it needs to be. Uh, so identity lifecycle rules, password policy, compliance checking. Um, again, with Active Directory, that's pretty easy, right? It's, it's built into it. Notifying users to change their passwords before they expire. So again, Active Directory has that built in. Most people are using that, uh, but websites as well. Um, we want to make sure that, that users are getting an email or a pop-up that says, right, and everybody's seen that, in 10 days, your password is going to expire. Consider changing it now. And then in 11 days, everybody comes in and users call you and like, my password doesn't work. That's what happens when you click ignore or delete those. Um, life cycle change, including uh, accounts that are inactive for more than 30 consecutive days. Uh, there's a bunch of tools out there, a bunch of scripts that, that you can use. Uh, they say more than 30 consecutive days. It, I would say it depends on your organization's risk tolerance or risk acceptance on that. Uh, we did it on a quarterly basis. Anybody that had been inactive for more than 90 days, um, we would check that and, and run it. That's what they wanted to do because they didn't want to get harassed 30 day, every 30 days by me. That's fine. Uh, identifying any new accounts that have not been used for more than 10 days following creation. So you create a new account. How many times have people had that happen? Immediate. We, we have somebody starting tomorrow. You have to create the account right now. And then like a month later, you're like, this person, did they even start? Or six months later, oh yeah, no, they didn't show up. They took another offer. So you need to have something in place for if a user account is created, if it hasn't been logged into within 10 days, it's kind of a good check, right? It's reducing your risk, reducing the exposure. Um, Sign accounts that are candidates for deletion because they've been suspended for more than 30 days. So when we do, we, when you do the the check for inactive accounts, disable the account, move it to a special OU strips, that strips out every permission. It's completely locked down, and then 
after a certain set period of time, in this case, they're saying for 30 days, you, what, what is your process for deleting those accounts? Uh, when contracts expire, identifying all accounts belonging to that business partner or contractor. So if you're gonna switch MSPs, do you know, do you have a list of all the accounts that are associated with that MSP so that you know you need to get rid of them or what, what accounts they had access to that you maybe need to change passwords to? Um, authorization creep, so this is very, very common when the subject is maintaining your old access and the new access. So in the example from before, David's moving from team A to team B, maybe he's moving from finance to um, HR or from HR to finance, whatever it is. Well, when we move him, he no longer needs access to the finance files. He's now in HR, but nobody ever removes him from those groups. They just add him to HR. So now you've got permissions to both finance and HR. That's where you get your permission creep or authorization creep. Uh, user rights must be routinely reviewed. Uh, I, that is a huge hassle, let's be honest, but it's something you really have to do. And this is where coming down back and saying, uh, identifying owners for your files and applications really helps you out as a security person, right? So you run the report and say, hey, Joe, here's a list of all the users for this application that you're the owner of, and here's their permissions for it. Are these accurate? Can you please review and, and give me an okay? How often do you do that? It depends on how much change there is, right? If it's fairly static, you probably get away with it once a year. If it's constantly changing, um, you, you're gonna wanna do it more often. Federal, federated identity management. So this is gonna go uh, a single sign on across organization to the internet, give you a single trusted authority for digital identities across multiple organizations. So think of it as a, um, well, Google, SAML for, so if you've got Microsoft and you're going to go out and federated systems out to the internet and trust your AD online with your internal AD. Um, Google account, GitHub, others. So it's when you're trusting your internal stuff out to the internet. Multiple ways to implement it. Again, SAML, OAuth, OpenID. Um, I think SAML is what Microsoft uses. I think that's right. I, again, I could be just making it up. I'm tired. Um, <laughs> XML-based framework for exchanging that security information, including the authentication data. So what you want to know there is you're taking your internal structure your internal authentication and sharing it and trusting it out to a web application or a web service. Single sign-on, you have identity as a service. Um, Gartner is saying you've got two, web access software for cloud-based applications for uh, software as a service and web architected, architected applications and cloud-delivered legacy identity management services. And then LDAP. So, LDAP is what uh, Microsoft's AD runs on, running on 389 for TCP, and LDAP Secure over TLS is 636 and 3269. I'm trying to remember. I don't want to tell you to memorize ports you don't need to, but those are pretty common ones, so it probably wouldn't hurt to have them. I don't remember if it was on the exam or not. Typically, my... Though, when in doubt, if it's on the slide with those numbers, I try to tend, tend to remember it. So, but if you're using Active Directory, those are, that should be kind of second nature to you. But yeah, TCP 389, uh, LDAP S, secured LDAP 636, 30, and 3269. This is highly testable, as it states. Single sign-on Kerberos, third-party authentication. Kerberos is the name of the three-headed dog that guarded the entrance to Hades. So the three heads of Kerberos were meant to signify the three A's. So um, it, you just need to know what, what Kerberos provides. It's gonna be an authentication service that may be used to support single sign-on, and then it was meant to, the three heads for the three A's. Uh, Kerberos Fax, Kerberos is a network authentication system. 
So on physically insecure networks, key distribution, communicate over networks to prove identity to each other while preventing eavesdrop or replay attacks. So it's gonna give you integrity, data stream integrity, and then the secrecy using a, um, as, such as DES. I hope they're not using DES anymore. That would not be good. Uh, and then Needham Schroeder symmetric key is based on the, there you go, forms the basis for the Kerberos protocol. So it's giving you a, a session key between those two parties so that only those two parties can connect to each other, right? So both sides have that key. We know that it's secure. Uh, SIGO sign-on is using secret key encryption. Mutual authentication for the clients and servers. It's protecting against the network sniffing replay, right? Because you've got a single uh, symmetric key. Both sides are using that, that secret key. You don't, if you don't know the key, you're not getting into that communication tunnel. Um, version 5 is in RFC 4120 if you want to read it because everybody likes reading RFCs, right? It's what I do in my spare time. All right. So when we look at Kerberos, again, this is what you want to remember. We've got um, these are the different parts of it. You will need to know these. This is this is testable. This is the part that uh, I I definitely remember being asked what given it be, they were, I was given a scenario and then I need to know which of these was the correct part of Kerberos that answered the the kind of the scenario that was given. So your principal is your client or service using it. The realm is what your Kerberos network is. So and if we're looking at it from like a, an Active Directory standpoint, it would be me. I'd be the principal. The realm is my Active Directory network. The ticket is the data that authenticates my identity. So I'm going to identify myself. It's going to give me do a ticket. The credentials are the ticket and the service key. You have a key distribution center. That's going to be the, the main place where it's going to go back and um, uh, handle handing out those uh, those keys, those secret keys. You have a ticket granting service and a ticket granting ticket, and then client server communications between the two. So if you know those, and I'm going to go to the next one here real quick. So we go back, we look and say, I'm Sam. I need a ticket to get ticket. So I'm saying, here's my identity. I need to be able to get. I need to show a ticket so I can go get tickets to, to other places, right? I need to go hit this server, server X. All right, here is your ticket, but you need to respond by providing your password. Once we get that password, I'm going to say, okay, here you go. Give me a service ticket. So now I'm, now I'm logged in. We get a service ticket where it's going to come back and say, okay, yes, this person is who they say they are. And then I'm going to say, all right, authenticate me. I, I, I am who I said I am. I've got a ticket to prove it. Now I've got a client server connection. And another slide here. This is actually a really good, I'd say if you studied this and understood this, this is really going to be helpful. Um, again, principal keys. It's going to be uh, the name and principal key to the connection. We then say, I'm going to request my ticket. Key distribution center is going to generate that session key and a ticket, granting ticket. So now I've said, hey, I've got a ticket granting ticket, and I've, now I'm going to authenticate myself. We come back the other way. We've, we're encrypting the ticket granting ticket and a copy of the session key where is encrypted. And now I'm going to extract that and log in or verify my password, enter my password. Go back the other way to four here, step four, generate a service session key. So now we know I've authenticated, I've, I've decrypted that ticket granting ticket and shown who I am. Now I've got a session key. It's going to go back and now I've got a secure connection, secure session, and I can go back and, and say, all right, server, I, I've proven I've said I am who I am. I've, 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 I've authenticated. There's... So I think if you go, if you know, if you know these, um, what these, these phrases or these words here are for, I, 
uh, I think it's fairly straightforward. Right? You get a, you you log in, you get a ticket granting ticket, which then gives you a ticket that authenticates your identity. So you have to get a ticket granting ticket to get a ticket. I guess that's not that straightforward. Now that I say it more times. All right. I'm going to pause. Anybody have questions on this? I can see questions. No? I don't know if it would be helpful to anybody else, but the way I learned to explain this to other people was like going to the county fair. I don't know if you want to repeat this or if they mm -hmm. can hear me out there. I may repeat it. So think of it going to the county fair. Going to the county fair. When you first are authenticating, you're paying your money at the ticket booth. Okay. And then a lot of the fairs now use wrist straps. Mm. So that's your session fee, your session ticket. You, have, you get in Windows, what is it, the default? 10 hours it's good for? Yeah. You can be on the fairgrounds as long as you have that wrist strap on. But now you see the Ferris wheel and you want to go to the Ferris wheel, you walk up to the Ferris wheel and the carney says, I need a ride ticket. So if you think of the, the, the other tickets as your service tickets, as the ride tickets, you have to go back the key distribution center, get a ride ticket, now you go back to the carney. And of course, once you're authenticated that you can ride because you paid your ticket, they can still hold you up to that ruler and say, ah, you're not tall enough. That goes to your local yeah, NTS that's permissions that's or whatever else you have. That's a really good way of explaining that. That's, man. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I, I don't know if everybody could hear that online. Let's see. Look and see. I tend to be pretty loud, so. Yeah, looks like they could hear it. So that's a good way of looking at that. Um, so what are the strengths of a single sign-on? It's mutual authentication, client and server. Uh, if you have a rogue key distribution center, it's not gonna have access to the keys. It's gonna mitigate replay attacks, right? So using uh, timestamps, right? So you have your ticket, granting ticket and your ticket, they're only good for a certain period of time. So you, it's gonna minimize the, the replay attacks for that. Weaknesses, well, it's gonna have plain text keys of all your principles. Um, a compromise of the KDC would be a compromise of every key in the Kerberos realm. So if your KDC is compromised, that's bad times for everyone. Uh, you got single points of failure. Replay attacks are possible for the lifetime of the, of the authenticator. So if you do, remember you've authenticated, you've got a 10 hour window. So now you do have a, a, you've been authenticated, you're authenticated for 10 hours. It's good for 10 hours. Um, and you could request that session key for another user and it's not going to uh, mitigate a malicious local host. So you could have plain text keys. Anytime you have plain text keys, right, you've got a big risk there. But overall, Pretty good. Uh, you'll need to know Ker uh, Kerberos. Another one is Sesame. Man, the only time I ever think of this one is when we do this class or when I took the test. I haven't seen this uh, in a lot of places. So secure European system for applications in a multi-vendor environment. Single sign-on for supporting heterogeneous. So this is kind of a sequel to Kerberos. It gets rid of plain text keys, um, uses that privilege attribute certificates in, in a place of tickets. Uh, so I think with Sesame, you'll just need to know it's a single sign-on uh, and it, the biggest difference is it, it doesn't, it gets rid of um, plain text and uses that privilege uh, attribute certificates. Isn't that very similar to, to Kerberos? I don't remember seeing any of those questions on the test. Radius is a remote dial-in, remote authentication dial-in, third-party authentication system. This was used a lot for um, uh, on network devices to authenticate back to like an Active Directory to log into you know manage your switches and routers. Uh, RC is 26, or sorry, 2865 to 2866. It's using UDP over 1812 and 1813. Notice they are for different uh, purposes each port, authentication and accounting. Uh, 
uh, unofficially assigned ports of 1645 and 1646, considered a AAA. So it's going to authenticate that subject credentials against an authentication database. How is it doing that? Well, again, it's going to go back to, uh, well, most of the time where I've seen it is, is the way to remember it is, right? It's going to, you're going to log into the Radius server to manage your devices. Radius, when you log into Radius, you use your Active Directory accounts. It's going to authenticate you against your Active Directory. It's going to authorize you to do the appropriate actions and manage whichever devices are, are allowed. Um, and it's giving you accountability for the data session, creating a log entry for any time there's a connection. Request response uh, attribute value points. So when, these are the valid um, codes. So you have an accept request. I'm sorry, access request. So I'm gonna I'm gonna request access. Is it gonna be accepted or rejected? And then we're gonna re account right accountability. It's gonna be law. It's gonna log uh, if it was what the request was and the response. Then the challenge says so going to look for your password and then what's your the status for the server and the client, which are experimental, what, where, what is their status? So there you go. Packet type, you're getting an access request with our username and the password. We're going to either give it a, an accept or reject if they're allowed to do it or not. And then uh, a replay for that access challenge. Pretty straightforward. It's just, an, again, another um, Another way to to do a single sign on, and here would be your kind of an example of that. So again, they've got dial up or VPN managing your wireless access points, your switches. You log into the Radius server. It's going to sit out in your DMZ. It's not going to be internal, or it's not going to be out. Uh, you don't want to make your Active Directory uh, accessible, right? It's going to get add another layer and allow you to manage access to multiple different services. Um, diameter came after radius, so it's going to give you, again, that authentication, authorization, and counting, attribute value pairs, but it's going to support more, right? So radius was 8 bits, and diameter is 32 bits. So instead of 20, 256 possible value points, now you've got billions. Um, uses a single server to manage policies. Again, I think what you need to know on this one is that it so it it was the successor to Radius. It uses Radius is eight bits, diameter is 32 bits. Uh, transmission it uses trans, TCP. I don't. I think again, successor to Radius, more secure, eight bits versus 32 bits. It's really what you need to know on that that I remember, and that is using the AAA functionality. Taxis and Taxis Plus, centralized access control, allowing users to send an ID and static password for authentication, UDP 49. Uh, so reusable passwords, it's a vulnerability, right? So Taxis Plus provided a better password protection using two-factor. Uh, they are not backwards, Taxis Plus not backwards, <coughs> excuse me, pack, backwards compatible. Um, what is it using? It's a very similar to Radius. Uh, Radius. So here's a good point at the bottom. Radius only encrypts the password. Taxis Plus encrypts all data below the Taxis Plus header. So all the username and password are going to be encrypted versus just the password with Radius. But again, same thing, very similar um, when we look at you know, instead of it being a Radius server, you could easily put a, a Texas, Texas Plus server in, uh, in there and would serve basically the same functionality. PAP and CHAP. So password authentication, not strong. <laughs> the password in it is sent across the network in clear text. I think that's the definition of not strong. I'm not sure you get it much weaker. Um, when you receive it from the PAP server, it's authenticated, validated. I don't, I don't think I've ever seen PAP actually in use anywhere, but you do need to know it. So it's a password authentication protocol sent in clear text. CHAP is your challenge accept. So it's going to give you that protection against your playbacks. Um, so here's what it would look like. Hey, I need my 
username you're going to challenge. What's your, here's my username, my password, or my encrypted password are yes, we're the same, we're good to go. Or if it's failure, it's going to, if it's not the same, it, it comes back and, and fails. Um, yeah, if you want to read about it, I think, again, the points you see up here is really what you need to know. It's giving you protection against playback attacks and central location that challenges remote users. Um, secret only known to the same getter in the peer. So, uh, I'm trying to think what the, the good example that would be. The um, Maybe we have the, the certificate installed on a workstation, right, where it's not actually going to send that information over the network. It's just going to verify that you have the right information and send back an encrypted packet. Is it giving me the right response back? Yes, it's it's successful if it doesn't have the right information already that the remote play, or remote user or remote system ha knows or should have, it's not going to successfully authenticate back. But, makes sense? All right. I can't tell if people are confused or just slowing down because it's getting late and this is not exciting stuff and we're getting closer to the end of the uh, the program here. So Active Directory domains, um, access control, control. I'm sorry, yeah, access control. Uh, it's going to use RFC 1510, so that's Kerberos. That's been implemented since uh, 2000, Windows 2000. So each domain is a separate authentication, and then so you can have right multiple domains within an organization. Those domains can then be trusted. So you can have one-way or two-way trust. Um, two-way would be if I'm in domain one and I, there's a two-way trust between domain two, any user in either domain is trusted between them as opposed to a one-way trust where I'm only going to trust it one way. I trust domain one so those users can come in and, and do anything in domain two, whereas domain two users could not do anything in domain one. It's not trusted that way. So AD um, uses Kerberos. The important thing on that one. Uh, so this is how how trust works. It depends on how it's configured. It's one way. So again, uh, they look at it this way: if David and I, if I trust David, he can do anything on my domain, but he doesn't trust me. I can't do anything on his domain. There's a two-way trust. Either way, we can go either way, and we're we're are going to trust that user, trust what they're doing. Um, yeah, I, uh, non-transitive, so, uh, that'd be good. so that's a good one. So non-transitive, so if we have everybody in here is a domain, if we have non-transitive, it's only the people that trust each other. So maybe I trust David, but I don't trust you, All right? Well, if David and I have a two-way trust, he can't get through to your, your information. You don't have a trust with him. But if we have a transitive trust, if I have if I trust another domain, anybody I trust will automatically trust those other domains. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. Hey, look, we've got seven slides left. Look at that. I'm flying through this. I don't have as many stories as Evan. Um, so primary models, discretionary access control, mandatory access control, and non-discretionary access control. Um, we'll go through each of these. There's no one that's better than the other. There's very specific purposes for each of those. So discretionary is giving, again, it's giving the subject full control of the object they have been given access to. Um, we, again, we look at it from a file share standpoint, you're using discretionary access control. So if I create a folder, I have the ability to go in and create and add users to that, share that folder with, with anybody that I want uh, to have access to it. So the problem would be we, we lose some of that. There, it increases the risk, right? So if somebody accidentally does grants access they shouldn't, well, now we could have a loss of, of confidentiality or 
somebody that shouldn't have access is now going to be having access to it. Um, I think the biggest one is, is probably typically um, uh, just mistakes, right? They didn't realize that they were they only want somebody to have read read access to it, and they give them full control. But that's what your Windows and Unix is, where again the the owners of that folder or that file have full control of it. They can do with it what they want. They can share share it with whoever they would like to share it with. Mandatory access. So this is going to be based on subject clearance and object labels, and this is. Um, yeah, government. I don't think I've ever again. I've never seen this in in the business environment. So this is more military uh, government. But again, subjects and objects have clearance and labels. So confidential, secret, top secret. So it can only happen if um, the subject level is equal to or higher. So if you have, if it's a secret object and you have a top secret clearance, you're good to go. You can access it. So it's flipped. If you're as a subject, you only have secret clearance, and the object is top secret, you're not going to be able to access it. It's pretty cut and dry, very black and white on that. Um, okay, this goes back to you can't share objects with other subjects who lack proper. So you can't write down. Yep. Um, and then you can see how this all comes back and ties together, one way or the other. Um, and then it's yeah, it's expensive and difficult to implement. Can you imagine having to go through and classify every piece of data and every user and making sure that permissions are set correctly? Um, so mandatory access, Honeywell, SCOMP, or Purple, Purple Penelope, uh, US and British government, so there you go. Uh, Linux intrusion detection um, using uh, Mac. So again, just know that it's, it's based on the clearances of the subject and the object. The subject has to be equal to or higher than the object's clearance to have access. Non-discretionary, so this is, again, you need to, so role-based non-discretionary, um, need to know that those two are, are the same. Uh, so you're grouped into roles. Again, Active Directory is probably the most common you're going to have different groups and access it. I, I've been under the understanding that just Active Directory is discretionary, but it can emulate a role base. It, yeah, that would be a good way of putting it. So you, you, well, by default, like a Windows workstation or a file server, you could have, you would do that, but you could implement a role-based access control in Active Directory. Yeah, you create groups right. for roles. Still, anybody with admin rights could make changes. Yeah. 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 I, I think um, I I'm trying to think whether. Like uh, apps development. I was going to say banking. That would be a big one where you're a teller, you're a mortgage broker, you're a bank manager. You don't have access, you don't have a choice. That's a. I, uh, I think that's a better description yeah, right. of it. You get assigned and you're either, you know, a yeah. user level or you're a mm -hmm. supervisor level or a, an admin level, and that's then within the app or framework. Yeah. I, yeah, that might be a better, I think that's a better way to, to put it, right? I think, so if we think of it from, from the application, from, like, let's go with banking, right? So you would have maybe a teller, head teller, mortgage, officer, bank manager. You've got four roles. Your account, you're added to one of those four groups, and you have the access associated with that role, and that's it. You don't have any choice in the matter. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, not discretionary because you don't have a choice when once you get assigned to that role, that's what it is. And you have rule based, <clears throat> um, not full fledged. Man, lose my voice. Uh, defense and depth supporting role. <clears throat> Excuse me. Next week is going to be fun. I'm doing this in four days. I'm going to have no voice by the end of the week. Um, so added. <clears throat> excuse me. Additional control typically to DAC systems. This, 
It, yeah, my voice is gone. <laughs> Luckily, we've got, oh, this is the last slide. Uh, <clears throat> man. Okay, first one. Additional criteria beyond, beyond it. Uh, so if all employees of an organization have access to an HR database for their, their information, um, if you try, you know, everybody can log into the HR, but you can only see your, your data. You can't see other people's information, right? So it would be adding an additional level to it. All right. Thankfully, we did it just in time because, man, it's going to be fun. So 324 on the book. Next Tuesday, it's going to be security assessment and testing. This is a little, yeah, it's, a, it's more practical. Uh, so read up, come back with questions. Evan will be teaching, and I'll have no voice. All right. Hey, two in a row. Finished early today. Look at that. All right. Everybody catch up on your reading.